Yeah. Yeah. Um, it means it's buds at either end, or both ends, I should say. Uh, monopolar would be that you'd only see buds coming off one end. Bipolar means it would come off either end. But the confusion may be with multilateral budding, which is going to be um, monopolar first. It's going to have the first bud is going to be at one end. And then when that scar is there, then it may go to the other end and then go all around. My confusion was when bipolar budding, do they have to be simultaneously budding? No. No, 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 no. It'd be, it'd be one end yeah. and that break off the other end? Exactly. That's well, the point. How could you tell if it's bipolar or... Uh, it has to be polar. asymmetrical, doesn't it? I think the monopolar budding, um, the other end of the cell doesn't look the same way. That would be the only difference. Do we run into any that are monopolar? No. No. No, no. Right. Um, about the about the midterm. Uh, yeah. Is it possible that you put a sample midterm or something like that? Yeah. What, okay. Uh, I'll put some. You people have been very good about not walking with things, uh, walking away with things. So I'll put I'll put uh, some old tests, finals and midterms all together, in the um, in the room. The trouble is the problem with them that I can't make a copy of them is that they're um, dittoed and they don't Xerox well. And so the only copies I have, so please uh, don't walk off with them. And remember that the, the, the course material changes, has changed substantially uh, from time to time. So if you see things you don't have the foggiest notion, what it is, better learn it. Now, it, may, it may be something we haven't discussed. Is there any other question before we begin? Well, Leslie and I have a question. Yeah, OK, together? Yeah. Um, yeah, that means <clears throat> that it's not restricted, and I think you'll notice that in the, that, <clears throat> that would be bi broad-based bipolar budding, where narrow-based would be like that. See the difference? If it's just C, let me see. Um, well, yes, because if it's multilateral budding and you find some multilateral ones, then you can call it that. If it's just if it's not multilateral budding and bipolar, you'd have to look at it quite a bit. But the thing is, this, the, the cells are shaped different, differently too. They're not so oval; they're much longer. I think maybe if you look in um, in some of the texts, Slaughter, some of the others, you'll see quite a bit of difference between, say, Clechera and uh, Saccharomyces. The only, I think that once they're, once they're dividing, you have no, dis, no problem. The problem is if they're not dividing yet, then you, really, then you really can't go just by the cell shape itself. Well, I think we can start now this time. Uh, the important news is there'll be a midterm tomorrow, um, tomorrow next, uh, next Tuesday, and it will cover everything up through Thursday, everything that we have discussed or that you've done in the lab or that we've talked about that you want to do in the lab. Uh, I had, see if I can bring some order out of the shambles of last Thursday's uh, lecture. One point, one, one where along the line, um, I mentioned we had the, the handout for Picia, and it indicated that some Picia fermented. And I got confused there and thought maybe there had been a mistake in the, in the drawing that I had made. But it is true. A lot of the Picia species do ferment. The question was raised, ferment what? What would they ferment? At least, at least glucose or fructose, yeah. Um, that's what you mean, what they ferment. They may ferment some other sugars, too. Uh, the Levy-Hauser chamber <laughs> is, as John Jaffrey pointed out, the largest square that is the overall field. The number of cells in the largest square times 10 to the fourth is the factor. Gives you the number of cells per milliliter. Whereas the Petroff-Hauser, you take the smallest square and multiply times 2 times 10 to the seventh. All right, now here's this one. <laughs> I don't know how we got the misprint on the handout, but please change it. Um, I think we can go through it a little bit, too. You're only, we're only talking now about raffinose positive. If you get a raffinose positive uh, fermentation, you want to know more than that. You want to know if it's, if it's um, 
uh, one third of the molecule is fermented, or two thirds of the molecule, or the whole molecule. Well, now you can figure this out knowing the structure of raffinose and knowing that it's made up of overlapping units of melobios and sucrose, and finally made up then of galactose, uh, glucose, and fructose. But uh, Dr. Lauder has been very kind to, prevent, to give us a nice uh, simplified method here. So let's just say that if, if sucrose is negative, you do all these other tests too. These are only with raffinose positives. It's raffinose negative, forget it. Sucrose negative, melobio is positive, and galactose positive, and that meant the raffinose one-third is fermented. Actually, it's galactose is the one that's chopped off and fermented. If sucrose is fermented, but melobios isn't, then you only get, you get one-third fermentation, and that's the, the uh, glucose coming off this other end, and it doesn't matter whether galactose is fermented or not, because that's kept intact with the melobios part of the molecule. And then here you can have sucrose and melobios both fermented, that is, both of those bonds being broken, but galactose not being fermented. And so then you'd only have two-thirds. And then if they're all fermented, then you'd have three-thirds. And I advise you to, to get that straight in your mind, if it isn't already. OK, ordinarily, I'd like to start off with uh, questions and discussion of the time before. But we, I have a pretty long lecture today that I'd like to just jump right into that on control of fermentation rates, because we want to get this out of the way, because very soon we're going to be doing some experiments along these lines. Um, what I would say is that. If you hold your questions in, if you don't mind, until the lecture, lab lecture on Thursday, and we can have a little review as much as you want on anything that we're going to have been, has been covered uh, up to, the, from the beginning up to now for the uh, midterm. Okay, we want to know the uh, control of the fermentation rate. And we want to know essentially how fast, is, how fast does the fermentation go? How can we predict that? What, what are the factors involved? Uh, you can think of offhand that the strain of the organism would be important and the various conditions. Well, we want to know more about what these conditions are. What is the, what you might think, what is the ultimate thing? What is really carrying out the fermentation rate? Is it yeast or what is uh, doing the actual? That's right, the enzymes are carrying out the glycolysis. And so we want to know more about the, the enzymes of glycolysis. And I've um, put three things that we need to know about them. We want to keep these in mind every time we start talking about a fermentation rate. The amount of the enzymes that are there. Now, this is not necessarily equated with the amount of, of with a cell number, but it's the cell mass, the total mass of enzymes there. You can imagine uh, two different cultures having the same concentration of cells, but one, cell, one, one culture having very big cells with lots of dry weight and lots of enzymes, and another having less. Well, naturally, the ones with other things being equal, the ones with the, most, the more enzymes are going to carry out the fermentation. Another thing that we need to know are the, the kinds of enzymes. You can imagine a strain of yeast, a mutant strain, that lacks one of the enzymes and can't carry out the fermentation. Well, it may also be that the other strains of different strains of yeast may have more of a limiting uh, enzyme than another one, and so they're able just a priori able to uh, carry out the fermentation better. Uh, the kind of enzymes itself can also be controlled not only genetically, but by the conditions of the cell, the growth of the cell itself. You know about repression, end, pro uh, end product repression and end product uh, stimulation, where you can actually change the, uh, the enzyme complement of cells. And so we, this, this could be an effect on the, uh, on the fermentation rate. And finally, we want to know about the activities of the enzymes. The enzymes may be there. There may be a lot of them there. But they may be inhibited one reason or another, either because uh, they may be defective. They may have a, a, bad, uh, a bad gene that made them for one thing. But more than likely, they would be, um, could be feedback inhibited or feedback activated by different products that are the different uh, uh, substrates inside the cell. Or the coenzymes could be different there. And also, the activity of the enzyme, we know, is dependent upon the temperature uh, of, the, of the enzyme itself. So we want to keep these three, these three things in mind when we're going to talk about ultimately about the, the fermentation rate, that these other things can have a very uh, direct influence, although it might be hidden. We might not realize it to begin with. <coughs> 
Well, glycolysis should be easy for it should be easy for us to talk about this. It's one of the most studied reactions in biochemistry, and it was the most studied one right after Pasteur's time. And we should be able then to make a prediction, knowing all the KMs and the substrate concentrations and the amount of enzyme in the cell. We should be able to put all this into a computer and come out with the fermentation rate. But actually, we can't do that. One thing. Yeah, it's very, very complex, but I, I don't think that's a drawback. I think there are probably computers that can handle it. There's been some attempts to do this. But the most important thing, strangely enough, we don't know very much about glycolysis in wine yeast. It happens that even though glycolysis and other metabolic um, reactions of yeast were very much studied after Pasteur's time, it very soon went on in other directions. One is that they discovered the glycolysis in both plant tissue and in animal tissue, and this is far more dramatic in a way, and so a lot of the work, or most all the work, then went into other uh, fields, other um, disciplines, and wine yeast itself, when yeast were studied, wine yeast were kind of left behind. I think it's kind of interesting to think about Pasteur's discovery. A few any of you in 106, I make this point there, that uh, he proved that uh, the yeast are important in fermentation, and, and these are living organisms, and one of the kinds of proof you have to have for this, or other kinds too, is that if you break the cell apart, you can't get any fermentation. Now, this is a non-biochemist looking at it. This is a biologist saying that, you, that, that uh, yeast must be very well organized, must be living structures, because when you take them apart, they won't carry out glycolysis. But we know, indeed, they will, that you can get a cell-free extract. Uh, that will carry out glycolysis, and this shows that this isn't the important aspect of to, to define whether something's living or not. And the very fact that Pasteur used a yeast that wouldn't do this uh, is kind of an interesting, kind of a ironic uh, statement, I think. But it just shows that how that Pasteur in his time, and even today, was is a, a giant amongst uh, microbiologists, but that that we got away from using the same substrate that he was working with in the first place. Another reason why we've gotten away from it, or the biochemists gotten away, gotten away from it, not only the dram dramatics of working with animal and plant tissue, but along came molecular biology, and yeast didn't fit into this pattern. It was very difficult to do molecular biology in yeast. Uh, what, was the, what was the big impetus in molecular biology, would you say, and with what organisms, and why? Yeah, enteric organisms. Why? What did they discover? You think? Phage and transduction principle and then transforming principle. These things are very important in, in starting molecular biology. And even now, we, there's some reports of, of uh, killer strains of yeast. We mentioned this already as viruses, but it, they certainly haven't been worked out. Of course, conjugation in, has been studied in the yeast, and, um, and gen, uh, molecular genetics has been studied in yeast. But this is really kind of a Johnny-come-lately. It's only been in the last uh, 10 years that that's been, a lot of that has been done. Well, so I don't think we can do it. Uh, that we can make a prediction on just knowing all of the details of the enzymes. Well, we could if we had all the details, perhaps, but we don't have all the details. So what's the alternative? And that's to do it empirically, isn't it? To, to uh, set up some conditions and measure some fermentation rates and vary the conditions and see how that changes. Now, again, we must remember that we are measuring only the, the end product. Of, we're only measuring the end result, the fermentation rate itself. And this is based upon all of these three things. And so we'll have to keep these in mind and, and come back to them each time we talk about a very, uh, certain kind of uh, influence that might have a, an effect on fermentation rate. Well, what factors would you guess, let's, let's have a guessing games, uh, that might be important as uh, influencing the fermentation rate or the growth rate or the cell, uh, the kinds of enzymes that are present, anything that ultimately would affect the fermentation rate? Do you want to um, uh, make some guesses? OK, that's a good one. pH, aeration, right, nitrogen sources. Carbohydrate sources. <coughs> Minerals. Let's put this all together here so we can call this nutrients. Minerals, vitamins. What else? Hmm? Well, let's put that under uh, vitamins, okay? Anything else? 
What do you do when you make wine? Well, alcohol, that's okay. Like an alcohol. Anything else? Sugar. Hmm? Sugar. Well, we've got carbohydrate sources. Let's put that, we'll put that in there. It, ooh. <laughs> That would fit in with the strain. We should put that there. We're going to just talk about one strain, but strain would be important. That could be very important because, uh, because could, I, I imagine it varies tremendously because the size, it would be, it would be the square of the diameter, wouldn't it? Or the, the circumference? So you get a square of the, square of the diameter. I don't really think about that, so we'll talk about that. <laughs> Anything else? Cell, cell what else do you do when you hmm? Cell number. Okay, um, I think we can, we can figure that if we had twice as many cells that it would do twice as much, under other things being equal. Um, anything else? What do you do when you make wine? SO2, SO2 yeah. Make SO2. Anything else? Quick, quick, anybody else? Oh, I've got one more. I'll leave that one as a surprise, or maybe, you, maybe you'll figure it out yourself. Well, let's start talking about uh, temperature then. Not because it's number one here, because it's number one in my notes. <laughs> um, you know what the Q10 is? What does that mean? It means how much something changes for 10 degrees centigrade. And generally speaking, fermentation rate is 2, what you expect for biological material. More or less, within a certain range, we've got to talk about a range of winemaking range, let's say 10 degrees centigrade to 33 degrees centigrade. You get on either side of these, you have strange things happening. Um, We'll come back to that in a minute. We're talking now about the fermentation rate is about, the Q10 is about two. Strangely enough, um, see, then this would be, this influence, let's go back to these things. This would be uh, probably affected the activities of the enzyme itself, of the enzymes itself. You wouldn't think that the temperature would have much effect on the kinds of enzymes, would you? Although there are uh, temperature sensitive mutants but I think that um, we wouldn't think that there would be much change in the, in the wild and, say, wine yeast in the enzymatic makeup at various, if it's grown at various temperatures, although this hasn't really been studied. That we'd have to leave that as kind of an open question. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah? The pH also has something to do with it. I mean, like, you had a pH of 3.5 at 10 degrees, and then you suddenly elevated the temperature. 33 degrees, the pH. I don't think by itself, but what else might it do? And we'll come to that in a minute. Oh, well, how high? 33. Yeah, you know, that you're not getting much dematuration then. It might change the amount of SO2, pre uh, the CO2 present. And this could have an effect. We'll come back to that. Now, I, I don't think that there's a uh, synergistic effect between pH and uh, temperature, although there probably is with alcohol. We'll come to that, because it's it tend to be more inhibitory at higher temperature. Um, but what about the growth rate of the cells, the amount of enzymes there? It happens, really, strangely enough, that the Q10 is much higher. Mr. O has worked on that, has uh, studied that, and it's almost five times between, well, maybe not that high, about this, about this range. Really kind of surprised. The growth rate of the yeast grows much faster than you would expect from a lot of biological, other biological systems. Um, we should talk a little bit about these ranges. Uh, as you know, all organisms fit into a certain range where you can predict what the, what the, uh, the uh, growth rate, growth constant is going to be. You know about the Arrhenius plots, where you have Arrhenius, A-R-R-H-E-N-I-U-S, where you plot, two R's, <laughs> right, where you plot the, the natural logarithm of the growth rate constant against the reciprocal of the absolute temperature. And you get a straight line within a certain range. Let's say we had that before as far as the, well, it doesn't matter what, within a certain range, say winemaking range. And at either end, you're going to have something strange happening. At low reciprocal temperatures, which means high temperatures, this is going to fall off because you're starting to get denaturation of enzymes. This is what happens, you get a stuck fermentation. And at this end, nobody really knows why, but you get, um, you get a, a fall off here too with most organisms. There are organisms called psychrophils that grow that do where this extends way down here to very cold temperatures, but yeast isn't one of them. Now the question was brought up what happens when you change this temperature as far as pH, I don't think anything, but as far as as far as with alcohol, it is important. You know we get a stuck fermentation at about what temperature? 
you say. You know, remember bit three? They say 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is how much centigrade? Uh, centigrade? Let's say 38 degrees centigrade. Yet, that's in presence of alcohol, stuck fermentation. Yet, if you measure the, the death of yeast in the absence of alcohol, you can go up to, say, 55 or even higher for a minute. So alcohol, so temperature does have an effect besides temperature itself. It has an effect on, say, alcohol inhibition. I'm getting my, ahead of myself about that one. That's, um, you can kill yeast without, in the absence of alcohol. It takes much more, much higher temperature to kill yeast if you don't have alcohol present. So what I'm saying is that temperature has its own effect of itself, and then temperature has an effect that the, uh, indirectly affects the alcohol's effect. Um, any question on, on temperature then? Yeah. yeah I, have a, I have a question here about these. I didn't, I didn't quite catch, uh, you, you said the Q10 is, is two for the, for the yeah. Yeah. I don't understand what this uh, five times thing is. Okay. For the uh, fermentation rate, Q10 is two times, and it's measured over this range. Mr. O also measured growth rate under winemaking conditions, that is with grape juice, and got a Q10 equal to 4.7 times over a range 10 to 20, 22 degrees centigrade. Me? And that comes as a surprise to me. Okay, let's try another one. Let's try pH. Nice one. Pardon me? Well, you're not really working about amylases here. We've got sugars. They're already broken down. Well, you wouldn't be having that in winemaking conditions. I don't know what. Uh, what that mean? I don't know what those measures are. Say in, in beer, you mean growth? Well, that's the, that's not with wine. You don't have to worry about that. We've got we've got glucose and fructose in the grape. You don't have to worry about any amylases, right? Unless we're talking about sake or something. Like um, now, the pH. <clears throat> uh, there is an effect of pH on growth of the yeast, the growth rate of the yeast. And it's not so little. Let's just say that, uh, that the growth rate at pH 4 is, is a unit of 1, some, some growth constant. And then at pH, pH 3, one unit, one unit down from that, it's 1 half of that growth rate, 1 half times. And pH 3.5, it's about three quarters. Now this is the growth rate. So this is going to tell us something about how fast the, the yeast grow. I don't think it tells us anything about what the final yield is going to be. And it doesn't, strangely enough, doesn't tell us anything about the fermentation rate itself because, well, the fermentation rate per cell does not, is not affected by pH. Let's to put this down, then we can have some questions. There, there's, there's no effect of pH on the fermentation rate of cell. Now let's think about, first of all, what that means, and second, why might that be? This would mean, then, if, if the pH did change the, the uh, total cell yield or cell mass, then we might be getting a change in fermentation rate because we might have different amounts of uh, cells there. But the cell itself is little affected by the, the fermentation by one cell is little affected. Now, why would that be? Do you have any ideas? Yeah. All right, that or more or less, but it's not going to change a whole lot. It, apparently, the growth is more sensitive to that than the fermentation itself. You've already built this complement of, of enzymes in there, and the little change in pH that might occur, the tiny bit of change that pH that might occur because you've made this big change here, is not going to affect the cells very much. Um, there was a question, Jed. You had a question. Well, I, oh. yeah. I just wondered if that conti continued linearly. No, um, the data that I've seen only went this, this far. Uh, of course, yeast will ferment much better, grow much better the higher you go up to a certain point. They don't do much better below that. They will grow a little bit below that. But the enzymes are uh, a function of the aren't they? They do have a cell-free extract. Exactly. 
Uh, let's just say, just take alcohol dehydrogenase. But you're talking about the optimal pH of uh, 7 or 8, much, much higher than we're talking about it outside. So somehow, this is a very intriguing point. How is it that the yeast is able to maintain this pH? And why can't, inside the cell, why, how is it it's able to grow at low pH, same as the lactic acid bacteria? Why are they able to grow there? And why aren't other organisms able to? Why can't uh, Clostridium grow at that low pH? Mm -hmm. Probably something to do with permeability of uh, different uh, ionic species, but it hasn't been well studied. OK, that, that's about all we have to say about pH. Any questions on that? OK, moving right along. Um, the next thing I have is the degree bricks starting. We can call that the sugar, in a sense. We can come back to sugar sources in a minute. So, but just the, the starting degree bricks, this could have some effect. Remember we talked about uh, if some yeast being osmophilic yeast and can grow in, uh, in honey and, high, and, and concentrate. This means that yeast, generally speaking, excuse me, are, except for these osmophilic yeasts, yeasts are generally osmo, osmophobic, that you get a certain inhibition from sugar itself. Now this would be especially true if you kind of combine sugar with alcohol. So once the fermentation has begun, that the effect of sugar is going to be more substantial. Um, this is the basis of the so-called deli units. We talked about this once, I think, a little bit. Didn't we? <laughs> if, sugar, if, if sugar is inhibitory at 80 degrees bricks completely, and alcohol is inhibitory at, say, 18 degrees, 18 percent, 80 percent, pardon me. Then you can say that sugar, that alcohol is about 4.5 times as inhibitory as sugar. And you can set up an equation with the 4.5 times the concentration of sugar plus the concentration of alcohol. And if that equals around 80, called deli units, then the wine will be stable and won't ferment. And you can do this. You can take fermenting wine and add high proof to give you the calculations that you want, and then let it sit in the cold so the yeast settle down. Rack this off, and the wine will be stable. And I'll give you some examples of alcohols and sugars that hmm, four and a half times the sugar, percentage of sugar. No, the alcohol is already more, much more inhibitory. Um, Four and a half times 18%. Sugar percent plus alcohol percent equal 80. Oh, you're right. Because you want the, ha, <laughs> yeah. How can that be? You want it to equal? Four and a half equals sugar times four and a half. <laughs> well, I got it here some ways. Uh, well, let's just figure out. I've got some here. Let's just, uh, yeah. Sugar, yeah. Alcohol, right. So it's got to be this other way. Oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This. Yeah. The alcohol is more inhibitory per unit, right, than the sugar is, right? All right. So. So here's some examples. If we had um, alcohol of 15% and sugar of 10% or another one, alcohol 13.5% and sugar of 15%, these both give a deli units of about 80. And these wines are stable. You might think, geez, who's going to drink these wines? But do notice that this is a 13.5% wine that is stable. If the Russians are uh, interested in this kind of uh, wine because it's lower alcohol than the 17% of sugar wine, of, uh, of dessert wines, and they are quite sweet, which they like. Yeah. It's it, not necessarily true that it's totally stable for all of you. Well, yeah, that's the point. This is, depends upon strain. Right, right. 
but the, the chances of getting of, a, of yeast growing in that under these bad conditions of SO2 and the high sugar and the high alcohol, it's, it's, I think, factually speaking, it is stable. Well, we're talking about this osmophilic effect, but you've heard about another kind of effect that happens with sugars, the glucose repression effect. You wonder, let's talk about that a minute and see what's that, what's that got to do with uh, winemaking. This is often called the Crabtree effect. And it seems to be really our catabolic uh, repression. Or glucose repression. Sometimes it's called the negative Pasteur effect. Because Pasteur, the Pasteur effect, as we'll come to in a minute, is the inhibition of, inhibition of fermentation by respiration or by oxygen. And here we're having the other way. We're having glucose interfering with respiration. Now, we say, well, uh, is this going to be a factor in our winemaking conditions? Mo this has been studied quite a bit. And it seems to be that in most cases, you're talking about glucose concentrations over a tenth of a percent glucose. You start getting the Crabtree effect. Sometimes it's been studied with some yeast up to 2%. So it seemed that it wouldn't be a very important influence for us, right? Because we're starting out with 20% with sugar, not 20% glucose, but fructose does this also. So we're starting out with 20% sugars, which, will in, which would inhibit the respiration all the time through all the fermentation. So we really wouldn't have to think that this would have any effect on the fermentation rate. Is that clear? It would have an effect would, on Yeah, but well, the thing is you're always going to get it. Starting at, except when, except possibly at the very end, right? When you're down to here, which means when, you're, when the fermentation is over, the dryness. Um, <clears throat> this would be, it would seem to be important, the glucose repression effect would have its most important influence then on this part here on the growing of the yeast and the kinds of enzymes that are being formed because in the presence of the glucose then the respiratory enzymes the mitochondria are not being formed they're being inhibited they're being repressed the formation of them so it's during this growth phase the yeast under winemaking conditions in presumably uh, We'll come to the presumably part in a minute. Uh, seem to be inhibited, uh, not having the, the mechanism to carry out respiration. And so they wouldn't have this part of the, this part of the mechanism during, throughout the fermentation, except the possibility at the very end of the alcoholic fermentation when the sugar was very, very low, then you could imagine perhaps the yeast would be able to build up a respira respiratory mechanism. Yeah. Well, they're always saying you have the wine a little aerated at the beginning to give them a shot to get going. Yeah, well, come. Yeah, it is a mystery, isn't it? Well, when we get to aeration, we'll have to we'll have to dovetail that into into this. It is. It's not easily. It's not. It's not straightforward. Yeah. What enzymes repress this respiration? Um, it's probably not not. It's enzymes that are making um, unsaturated fatty acids and sterols that are involved in the mitochondrial. Um, structure. Now there is some, there is a structure there they have found, people used to say there's no mitochondria, but by using good staining techniques or electron microscopy, it does seem that there is some pre-mitochondrial material there, but it's non-functional. And it needs, it needs glucose to induce certain enzymes, at least, to do, to, to do two things, to induce certain enzymes themselves, uh, glucose oxidases and other soluble enzymes, as well as to make some of these unsaturated fatty acids and sterols that are required for the the um, physical structure of the mitochondria itself or the membrane. No, that's the point that you, it's on the at least from the basis of what we know from this kind of work, that the yeasts are always under glucose repression situation, and so that they wouldn't have mitochondrial. Um, uh, apparatus or couldn't carry out respiration, except at the very end of the alcoholic fermentation, perhaps. Okay? We'll see that this, uh, there may be some other cases we want to talk about. <clears throat> 
By the way, how do you know how to demonstrate glucose uh, repression? How can you get the yeast to grow, to ferment in the absence of glucose? What would you use if you, if you, wanted, to, if you wanted to knock out this effect? Yeah, what, do you have any idea what ones you might use? Oh, let's, let's get this quite clear now we'll, when we come to that. Yeasts don't ferment pentoses, so it can't be that. So it has to be galactose, that's right. How is galactose uh, metabolized, remember? It's an oxidative pathway, right? It's being oxidized, forming NAD, NADPH, which then uses molecular oxygen to be re-oxidized again. And this is a, this is a way this, this effect is studied. Well, we'll come back to this when we talk about aeration again. I want to give you this background, though, that it would seem from the little information that we have that we don't have any mitochondrial system in the, in the yeast during alcoholic fermentation, except possibly at the very end. Well, now let's hit um, SO2. What effect uh, would SO2 have on the fermentation rate, would you expect? Well, in first. On the fermentation rate? Yes, it would have to do with the yeast. I'm talking about wine yeast then. Wine yeast that can do what? That can adapt to SO2. So we might think it might, at the first, I think you're right, Rick, that the, the, um, the lag period could be slowed, would be slowed down by SO2. But once the yeast have adapted, do you think their growth rate or the fermentation rate is going to be affected? Mm -hmm. not, not in the levels that you use for wine making. It shouldn't have any effect of all, at all. Now, if you go up to very high levels where you're, the cell can't tolerate it, up to, say, 300 parts per million, what's going to happen? What does the, what does the SO2 do, first of all, for fermentation? Hmm? Well, let's say acetaldehyde instead. Binds up acetaldehyde and prevents the reoxidation of NADH and so slows down fermentation. And the yeast that, that, that can't that can't uh, protect themselves against that, for one thing. And then, of course, at higher concentrations, SO2 would be practically would break, break bonds of the enzymes themselves. Would there be any effect with the body with higher rate? Yes, there's some there, but uh, that if you're using very high levels, that's not going to be enough to take count, take count, take it, uh, take it into account. The effect. One thing. Um, that if you are using various amounts of SO2, and it may not have any effect on the fermentation rate itself, it may be having an effect on the acetaldehyde concentration that you have, that you end up with, because it's going to bind with acetaldehyde. But we're talking about the levels that you would use normally in winemaking conditions with wine yeast. All right, now alcohol, come to that. Alcohol, we know, is a, as a great uh, denatur denaturator, <laughs> uh, denatures enzymes, as tough on proteins. Uh, this is presumably one of the ways that we can use alcohol as a sterilant. However, if you keep alcohol cold, you can uh, separate enzymes. Or you've done this in, bacteria, in biochemistry lab where you use uh, alcohol fractionation the way you would ammonium sulfate fractionation if you keep it cold, keep it below zero degrees centigrade. So in certain conditions it's all right. And also, presumably, the yeast cell has some def uh, defense mechanism, some way of preventing the uh, uptake of the alcohol, something that, say, baker's yeast can't do. And this is really uh, a very intriguing subject that nobody has really worked on at all. There's, I don't know of any postulate, any, any uh, mechanism presented that shows a difference between uh, alcohol-sensitive and alcohol-resistant yeast. Good problem for, a, I was going to say, a buddy, <laughs> a microbiologist. That's one that works on yeast, huh? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but we all, we also mentioned a minute ago about the effect of temperature. The temperature can have an indirect effect on the alcohol, that, that alcohol in itself would be inhibitory, but it, if the amount of inhibition would depend upon the temperature, I'm sure. Well, there are, that's true. There are other alcohols being made besides ethyl alcohol. There are fusel oil alcohols made, but they're made in very low concentrations, and they would be very inhibitory that they, they denature even more readily, they denature enzymes even more readily than ethyl, ethyl alcohol, and you have to be very careful about using them. Again, butanol is used for enzyme uh, purification or um, fractionation, but again, you have to keep the material cold and dry, too. Um, but the amounts of fusel oils that are made by, during alcoholic fermentation are not large enough uh, to 
cause any effect here. Acetaldehyde can be toxic, the same way the fusel oils are, and actually you can demonstrate this by growing yeast under aerobic conditions, I mean really aerobic, really aerobic with high amount of sugar, and have a lot of shaking. You can build up the acetaldehyde so strong that you can really, really smell it, and it'll inhibit the, inhibit the fermentation of the yeast, so the yeast cannot finish the fermentation. Now we know what level we can get by with, don't we? You know in, in submerged floor sherry culture, we can get up to about 700 or even maybe 1,000 parts per million acetaldehyde and doesn't seem to have any effect on the yeast. But I'm talking about higher than that. You can get higher than that by using very unusual <laughs> conditions. There wouldn't be winemaking conditions at all. Um, another one we didn't talk about on here would be CO2. CO2 has an effect on alcoholic fermentation, at least at high pressure. And this is different from other organisms. It's only on yeast. And we get up to seven atmospheres CO2, and we can completely inhibit fermentation. And this is what happens in, in champagne making. Now, what happens at, at, under normal conditions at atmospheric pressure? I don't think that there's any good studies on saying what does happen, but I think that it must have some effect. And maybe, hmm? Well, it can increase the acidity, but I think that more than that, I think that we might talk about the pH effect. The pH itself may have an indirect effect on the carbon dioxide um, effect. <laughs> that is, at, um, at uh, low pH, you're decreasing the solubility of CO2. And so that might be forcing it out, lowering the concentration, and may allowing a faster fermentation rate or growth rate than you would have expected at, uh, at that pH by itself because of the indirect effect on CO2. The same on temperature. At low temperature, what do you have? More CO2 or less CO2? You have more CO2. You'd be, you'd, other things being equal, you'll be keeping the CO2 pressure, or not pressure, but level a little bit higher. This may be affecting the growth or the fermentation. So at lower CO2, at lower temperatures, you may be getting more inhibition than you thought you might. And this may account for that 4.7 fold increase we saw, that you're not only measuring temperature effect, but you're measuring CO2 effect also. That's speculation on my part. Okay, we're not going too fast. We're going with one more uh, before we get to the good stuff. Uh, on particulate material, that would be the difference, say, between settled must and non-settled must. Now, ordinarily, we wouldn't think of this being too important in winemaking. It's more important in experimental wineries. We used the grape juice that we used to prepare for the class. We used to, let, instead of letting it settle and treating it with DEPC, DEPC we used to do uh, filtration on it. And it was really brilliant, sparkling. But it wouldn't support fermentation very well. It just wouldn't carry out a fermentation very readily. And we have to add materials. We have to add powdered cellulose or kieselgeur or bentonite to get it to, to go. We, so we don't do it that way anymore. But this has also shown up some cases in wineries where they're using vacuum filtration. You can, you can clarify white must by vacuum filtration, by centrifugation, or by settling. And the vacuum filtration takes out more of the material than either centrifugation or settling. And sometimes people have prob prob problems getting a good fermentation, getting a finished fermentation in this very clear must. Now, why, what happens? Anybody have any speculation? Your speculation is as good as mine. I don't know, but I have some guesses. One thing that does happen, when you have a particulate material there, you get a lot of turbulence. Uh, CO2 bubbles glom onto the particles and bring them up, and so you're getting the wine uh, boiling. So uh, what do you think this might, effect this might have on the? Increase the rate of fermentation. How come? Uh, more particles exposed to greater area. Just general mixing. Yeah. That probably is part of it, rather than the yeast just sitting down at the bottom, but I think the yeast even without the particulate material, the yeast themselves are going to be full of CO2 and flow too. But that might be part of it. Anything else you might think? Stir it up. Yeah, well, that's essentially what we think. Get rid of the CO2 fat. Yeah, I think that's it. People have often said, well, it's aeration, but we'll see. Maybe the aeration doesn't have anything to do with it. But it could very well be, and this has been suggested by other people, that you're boiling off CO2, and CO2 being somewhat toxic, you're increasing the uh, fermentation rate. Okay, let's talk about nutrients got all these here together. We talked about sugars already in the sense of uh, being um, osmophilic, osmophobic, 
and also as, as a sense of glucose repression. The other thing you could talk about would be whether the yeast would ferment fructose or, or, well not fructose, but maltose or lactose or something like that. Well, we've pretty well eliminated all that in our taxonomy. We're down to the strain, the strain of yeast that, or all the wine yeast that do have the same uh, pattern as far as whether they'll ferment a sugar or not. True, there is this uh, old bugaboo about some strains fermenting, say, glucose faster than fructose, and this might be a good way to make sweet wine because fructose is or the other way around, if it prevents glucose faster than fructose, since fructose is sweeter than glucose, but I think this is really uh, pretty hard to control or even to talk about. Right, so I don't think we need to talk about sugars anymore. But we will want to talk about the nitrogen sources. Now, yeasts are not fastidious organisms. They're not like the lactic acid bacteria. They, they can do very well on uh, sources of nitrogen such as uh, amino acids or ammonia themselves. And they can make almost all the vitamins. There's one vitamin the wine yeast can't make. You know what that one is? Biotin. Biotin, right. And it's very hard to demonstrate this because it's hard to get rid of biotin. It's, it takes so little and it's almost everywhere. Uh, so it's hard to demonstrate this, but it is true that the yeast can't make biotin. It has to be supplied. It's there in great amounts in grape juice. The other, the other amino acids, the other vitamins it doesn't need, but it can make them. But if they're supplied, that's even better. So you can get different amounts of growth rates, not fermentation rates necessarily, but growth rates depending upon the vitamins that are present there. And this was once the uh, basis of a way to classify different strains of yeast by saying, well, they, will, they uh, grow fast on biotin plus thiamine. They grow fast on biotin plus thiamine plus panathenic acid. They grow fast on biotin, not thiamine, not panathenic acid but uh, an acetal, or all these weird things, and they assigned a number to each one of these, and they called these BIOS numbers. And so you would have one plus seven plus two, two, et cetera, would characterize a certain strain. It's really a mess. It didn't work out very well. It's an interesting history and discussion of it in the book by Cook, Biology and Chemistry of Yeast, if you're interested in this. We, every, every now and then, somebody wants to try it again, but it doesn't come out very well. <clears throat> but, uh, But still, we did want to see if we could find, people did want to see if they could find, uh, if they could predict a rate on the basis of the amount of nit nitrogenous products that were there. Now, Professor Amarine and O have done a lot of studies on fermentation rate, setting up an equation such as this. Let's say you have the fermentation rate is equal to some constant plus some coefficient times some variable. Let's say the, let's just for example say the concentration of biotin. Plus another coefficient times some other variable, let's say the concentration of, of nitrogen or something. And so on, or you might even have the pH in there. Put a Z here, and so forth. And if you did a large number of experiments where you knew all of these, and then uh, measured the fermentation rate, by regression analysis you could determine what these constants were. And they did it, first of all, they did it with, with the bricks and pH and temperature and got the usual things, the usual things we already talked about. But they didn't, ma didn't make a big influence on this equation. There's no use really putting them in because you could, you could um, determine those, you could, uh, hmm, you could control those things very easily. So you wouldn't need to uh, determine the fermentation rate. You could set it all at one temperature and all at one pH and all one starting degree bricks. So that wasn't very helpful. But they went on to things like, like nitrogen. And they found that they could get a, a pretty good prediction knowing the amount of nitrogen and got a coefficient for that number. And then they would try, we'll come back to that, they tried ammonia. And ammonia didn't make much difference. So, so then O and I did it with biotin. And we did find we got a pretty nice equation then using nitrogen total nitrogen and biotin. We got the fermentation rate, that would be a degree bricks per hour equals 0.54 plus 0.0019 milligrams total nitrogen per liter plus 0.015 micrograms biotin per liter. So if you knew the total nitrogen and if you knew the amount of biotin, you could plug that in 
and you can get this up to 85% uh, accuracy. We defined 85% of the variables doing this. Now, there's a couple of interesting points here. One thing, it certainly would have been nice if it had been ammonia, because with the ammonia electrode, we could measure that right away. But ammonia doesn't have very much effect. This is kind of a tough one to measure, the total nitrogen. Biotin is even worse. Guess how we measure the biotin? Any idea? How you'd assay for biotin? But what? Bioassay, using uh, lactic acid bacteria. Bacterium. Um, the thing that's interesting here is that biot in all cases, biotin was there in very high concentration. And if we added biotin, it made no effect on this fermentation rate. But what did happen was, this is apparently a measure, a kind of an index of other nutrients or all other micronutrients that were present. So this was able to give a refinement to this um, equation. But you notice we still got, about, well, it's actually it was 84%. We still got about 15% variation in here that this doesn't describe. Anybody want, this is at, say, one wine yeast, at one pH, at one temperature, and one degree bricks. You want to guess what you think the other, the other variables might be. Have any ideas? Hmm? Uh, no, it's not the organic acid, probably not. Uh, and it's not amino acids either. That's interesting that the, the yeast can use all the amino acids you have in grape juice. Um, it doesn't use proline unless it has to, and that's the one that's there in the very high concentrations. That's very interesting that the proline is left behind, but yeast could use it. Anybody want to guess? I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but I have an idea. Remember we talked about these, hmm? What? Atmosphere. 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 How'd you know? <laughs> no, I think, huh? Light. <laughs> now, which way the earth turns? No, it may very well be these fatty acids, unsaturated fatty acids, and um, sterols that are important for yeast growth. And they, they are found on, we'll talk about them in a minute, well, not today, I guess, but they are found on the, on the skin of the, of the grapes. And we might be there in various amounts in the, in the uh, must itself, depending on how long the skin contact is, or the grapes variety itself, or maybe some other conditions of, of crushing. And this could be a variable that we haven't looked at yet. Well, our time, okay, question, one question. Said something about the increase in acid content yeah. must, it increased the NADH. Uh, mm. really Where did you hear that? Yeah, you know, I'm surprised. Maybe it does. Usually, they will, it doesn't work that way. It stays the same amount inside, the, just that the yeast uses that in preference to making it itself. But maybe it has some effect. I'll have to see the article. Well, time's up, and I, uh, we have lab today and tonight, and we'll have a lab lecture discussing about what we're doing. And I think that I'll uh, take the liberty of taking another 10 minutes in lab lecture and discuss the uh, Pasteur effect so we can have that out of the way. Or the effect of oxygen, I think. Right. And 